I want to welcome you to our Season of Advent Bible Studies Tuesday night. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the blessing of this Tuesday in Advent. We pray that you would bless us tonight with your presence. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hmm. Well, take a look. How many candles we got lit up here? One, two, three. One, two, three. It must be the third Tuesday in Advent. Oh, I know. Look at we, I'm kind of lighting my candles a little bit differently than our picture back here. They're kind of going counterclockwise. Um, that is not typically our tradition. I mean, it looks better, I guess, in the pictures. It's fine. But in our tradition, we typically start with the lower left-hand candle, upper left-hand candle, right-hand candle, upper right-hand candle. See, we're kind of making a circle. Same way they are, but they're going counterclockwise. We're going clockwise in the way that we light these candles. And uh, coming to a close here with the fourth candle next week, and then ultimately the Christ, or the Christ candle, the center candle, the Christmas candle. Looking forward to that. Today is the third Sunday. Or, uh, this last Sunday was the third Sunday, the 12th. And then, of course, today is the uh, third Tuesday in the season of Advent. And we talk, we've been talking about the tradition of the naming of our candles and about these newfangled traditions that we have. I know. You keep thinking that, hey, Advent candles have been around forever for thousands of years. No. It's only been a very short time that we've been using Advent candles. It's only been about 50 years or so that these things have been introduced in the church after the great liturgical revolutions of the 60s and 70s when we rethought our season. And you might remember the very first Tuesday Bible study, we talked about the color of Advent, how it used to be purple. Some of you might actually be old enough to remember purple on your altars during the season of Advent. Guess what? I remember purple on the altar during the season of Advent. All of a sudden, I went to seminary and said, where did this blue come from? My church was a, in Bethel Park was a very old school church. We're still using the hymn book that we used to use 50 years ago. They haven't changed that at all. They don't like change at my home congregation. It's a hard thing. So it took them a long time to get to using the color blue. They were decades decades and decades after before they decided to change the color to blue from purple. But the reason for that was to distinguish it from the season of Lent. Purple, color of repentance. Blue, a color of hopefulness and promise. So we have multiple traditions about the names of the candles. And you might have remembered that uh, we talked about hope. You know, the first candle being hope. Second candle, peace. But that wasn't the only tradition that we used for this. There are other traditions that we've used. Uh, the, there's another tradition which calls that first candle prophecy. Oh, I'm sorry, that would have been, um, yeah, that would have been the first candle. That's correct. And then repentance. You might notice, and I, I really want to distinguish why, and you'll see it today. Let me, let me. First of all, I'll list to you what the candles would be named in these two different traditions. Joy would be the third candle in our tradition. Today's candle in other traditions. Oh, I can't get an E on there, so you, there you go. There's an E there. Just trust me on that. Uh, it's right there. I can see it. Prepare. Okay? So prophecy, repent, prepare. So here's the thing, these, this tradition of these candles all have to do, when you name them this, and, and by the way, I'm not indicting you if you come from a church that names your candles prophecy, repentance, preparation. It's okay, it's just a tradition. It doesn't matter. It's what Luther would call adiaphora, it's the unimportant things, okay? It doesn't matter whether you call your candles by any name. It doesn't matter whether your church even uses candles, okay? Prophecy, repentance, preparation. But the one reason why I, I just, I'm not a fan of this, is that these all have to do with me. What do I need to do to get ready for Christmas and to meeting Jesus Christ? 
okay, and how I need to get my life together. Guess what? This hope, peace, joy all have to do with Jesus and what he brings into my life. And why we celebrate this season is Jesus. So that's why I kind of prefer this season and these names of these candles as opposed to these. If you follow this tradition, it's okay. Good for you. We're going to talk a little bit more about this today. Now, I will say this. If you wonder <laughs> where we get the third candle, often, now it's not up here, often it's pink in color. This one is the only one that changes color. And you're like, where did we get a pink candle? And why is that third candle pink? Well, if they're laying any other candle than the third candle pink, uh, that's a, that, I've never heard of that tradition. It's always that third candle. Why? Well, again, that's even a newer phenomenon. Remember, the Advent wreath itself is relatively a new phenomenon. The idea of that third candle being pink is even newer than that. I don't know when the, that started with the tradition of, of lighting that third candle's pink. Most people have no clue why, but it actually dates back to an ancient tradition of, uh, of Lent. That, remember, we had all these uh, Sundays in Lent in preparation, and they would always have a pink Sunday in the season of Lent. Lent was such a severe season, and such a harsh season. And so uh, they would have one pink Sunday, and on the pink Sunday... Uh, it was a day of celebration in the midst of season of Lent. So, I'm going to tell you this. Is, I'm just shooting off my head right now. I don't know this to be true. My gut reaction is this tradition of pink actually predates the color of blue and maybe even predates uh, the, the, some of these uh, Advent traditions. It might have all sent back to the time where uh, Advent was a, more of a season of preparation and more of a season of repentance. Uh, they celebrated that third Sunday is a pink Sunday, a day of celebration and joy. And so that's where the candle pink comes from. We don't have pink candles in our church. Um, that's just not part of our tradition. But I get it. That's where it comes from. So we have this joy as the theme of the day. And I would like to read to you the lesson appointed for today. And again, the joy that comes from Jesus being in our lives. And this is a promise in the book of Isaiah. Now remember, we read from what's called the lectionary in many of our liturgical traditions. You may not in your church, and that's okay too. But we find as we read a lot more of the scripture, by, uh, churches that read from the lectionary read much greater portions of the scripture in their, in their Sunday worship than do churches that don't use a lectionary. Because churches that don't use a lectionary, the pastor kind of picks his, his or her favorite passage of Scripture, and that's only like 10% of the Bible, and they ignore the rest of the 90% of the Scripture. Whereas if you have a lectionary that forces you to read large swaths of the passage of Scriptures that maybe you would never want to choose or read, you end up reading a lot more passages of Scripture. So um, it's a three-year cycle, again, with a lectionary. Matthew, Mark, Luke are the Gospels that are appointed for each one of those years. John is interspersed throughout, and there are Old Testament lessons throughout. But this is one of the lessons is appointed for this Sunday on, uh, on occasion from Isaiah 35. Rejoice, for the Lord is coming into the darkness. Rejoice. Rejoice and joy, they're the same root word, aren't they? Rejoice. So joy is the spirit that's in our hearts. Rejoicing is our celebrating as a result of the joy that's in our hearts, okay? For our Lord is coming into the darkness of oppression's exile to lead us home. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and be blossom. So again, the images here, just like last week when we talked about the dead stump of Jesse that now sprouted something spectacular, the images of the Bible are often so stark. Something that's dead, there's no life here. But it's going to well forth with water, the desert, milk and honey, okay? 
the wilderness, the dry land shall be glad. So even the wilderness, these inanimate objects, will rejoice as well too. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like a crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and sing. Hmm, important word here, joy, rejoicing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. Uh, the Lebanon, Lebanon, by the way, um, was a source, a lot of the, the woods, the wood that was used to decorate the temple, the, the, the cedar of Lebanon. You might have heard that spoken. Um, this is one of the reasons. There wasn't a lot of wood, workable wood in Jerusalem. In fact, there was like no workable wood. You couldn't go out and knock down a tree and make a, a, a furniture out of it from the wood that was in Jerusalem because they just had these tiny little spindly bushes and so forth and called them trees. Okay, so if you were getting wood, you had to import it. And the best wood in the world came from Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon that were then used in the, uh, in the temple. And now it's just abundant. It's everywhere, okay? The glory of the Lord shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel, Carmel and Sharon. Carmel and Sharon are two mountaintops. The, the worshipers of Baal worship in Mount Carmel, okay? Mount Sharon. So they are going to turn to Jerusalem and say, oh, we were wrong all along. Huh? You get it? And we're going to rejoice in this thing that's come because Baal is not certainly going to bring us joy. In fact, you know the difference between Baal and Jesus? Well, obviously outside of we as Christians believe that one is true and one is not. But Baal in their tradition and their mythology, Baal never comes down to live amongst us. Baal is on the mountaintop and only a handful of people can go up there to see Baal. But our God comes and dwells in our midst. That's the big difference. That's why we're rejoicing. They shall see, they shall see the Mount Carmel and Mount Sharon, where Baal worshiper goes, worshippers are. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Remember, God is always concerned about the poor and the weak. So if you dismiss the poor and the weak, you are anti-God. God is always about the poorest and the weakest. The great reversal that comes. This is why there's so much joy. There's so much poverty. So many people are hurting. They will rejoice because they, like the desert who have nothing, will well forth with life. Wow. Okay. Say to those who are fearful, be strong. Do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense, and he will save you. God is going to make right that great reversal. Make right everything that was wrong. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer. And the tongues of the speechless sing with joy. For the water shall break forth in the wilderness the streams in the desert, the burning sand shall become a pool. Isn't that grand? Thirsty grounds will spring forth water, and the haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No travel, not even a fool, will go astray. Well, that's good news, because... Trust me when I tell you I can get lost. Doesn't matter the GPS system I'm using. Take a right here. Oh, no. In 500 feet. I thought it said here. You know, it doesn't matter what GPS tells me. I'm always getting lost, right? But in God's way, even a fool like me will get to go. It's a straight road. We'll get to the right location. There's no turning. No rights, no lefts. It's a straight shot. Not even a fool can go off that road, right? No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. There will be, you know, again, it's not about the animals. It's about the fact that there's no, no potential for violence. You don't have to be threatened. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be on their heads. 
They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sign. We'll flee away. It's like a breath. You've let it out. It's gone. Joy is the theme for today. And it comes from who? Being in the presence of Jesus. Who sets the prisoners free. Who heals the sick. Who helps the powerless and fights on their behalf. Rejoice and be glad. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks again for the blessing of, wow, this Sunday, the third Sunday, the pink Sunday, the Sunday of joy. We give thanks for what it is that you're bringing into our lives in Jesus Christ and pray that you'll be with us as we prepare for this Christmas season to meet Jesus anew. Let us be inspired. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may you go with joy in your hearts today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.